Thank you, Jung Sook. That was amazing to see God work through her fingers and through the sound and have that Holy Spirit enter here in the floor. Well, good morning, church. My name is Victor Lozada, and I'm the worship leader today. And I'm so glad that each and every one of you are here and seeing God's great creation outside a beautiful fall day and some brisk weather. Would you please stand as you're able to and in body and spirit and join in singing today. We have a new form of worship, and we're just going to play off of each other with the band going and with some good old-fashioned hymns. We have lots of fun bringing the Holy Spirit into this house. And whose house? The Lord's house. Amen. Let's get going. Oh, 
to a neighbor or or um, if you want to you can you can do a socially distance 
greet your neighbor. I don't exactly know what that looks like, but, uh, you know, you could do a fist bump maybe or a, or, or a toe click or a heel click or, a, or an elbow or, or, or something. Um, but uh, it's great to have everybody together this morning. Uh, and it is great to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time. So let me, uh, let me just start with some announcements. Um, uh, Tanya, if, uh, if the children would come to follow Tanya and go to Children's Church, then um, uh, that would be great to start that way. Um, let me uh, invite you to, uh, to continue to support our church. Our offering plates are in the back. We're not going to pass the offering plates. Um, but through this whole time during the pandemic, our, our food pantry, our armed food pantry has continued to, um, to provide food for people who otherwise might go hungry. Um, our Mother's Day Out and Compass Enrichment Program has continued uh, to have uh, a place for, for, for kids who are homeschooled to be able to come and interact with other, um, other homeschooled kids in a, a, a social environment. And I think we've even expanded ARM this year, I mean, uh, MDO Compass this year to include ninth grade. Um, so uh, we're even doing more this, this year than before. Our toy store has started up. So we've had two different um, um, registration days. Um, I think that we've got at this point something like maybe around 80 families that are signed up so far. And we've got another registration on Tuesday night. So... Huh? Close to 90 families, even better. Um, we've got another registration on Tuesday night, so if you can come and help out, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, we're continuing uh, our small groups, and so the next small group is, is going to start this Wednesday night. Um, we're going to be uh, doing Adam Hamilton's uh, incarnation, uh, which is going to be a, um, an Advent uh, study for us. And uh, it's by Zoom. So if you've been getting the, uh, the Arbor uh, email, you'll find the link in there to be able to join us. If you have not been getting the Arbor email and you do want to join us, then um, hopefully you picked up one of these little sermon notes um, pages as you came in. Um, down at the bottom, there's a place for you to uh, enter a prayer request on one side or on the other side. Um, I, I've got it labeled ideas. This is for you to, to write something down and tear it off and put it in the offering plate. So if you would like to be a part of the small group by Zoom and you don't have the link, then um, put your name and, and email address or phone number some way that I can get to you on here and I'll make sure you get a link and you can join us. Um, this is what uh, Adam Hamilton says about this. My hope in this book is instead to explore the why and to what end, questions of the incarnation. Why would God come to us in Jesus? What was the purpose of the incarnation? How are we meant to respond to the incarnation, to God's coming to us in Jesus today? So those are the things that we'll look at, and I hope you can join us for that. Um, but none of these things that I've talked about would be possible without your financial support. That's how we can provide all of these different things that we're doing. So, um, so please do continue to support us. Uh, tonight is going to be our annual charge conference at five o'clock. It will be by Zoom. There are charge conference packets on the back tables for you to pick up if you would like to. There's an agenda there too. Um, and so we'll be meeting with our district superintendent, Dr. Henderson at five o'clock. And uh, he, he's promised to keep it to an hour max. My guess is it'll be under an hour, um, but please join us for that if you can. Um, there are all kinds of ways that you can help serve uh, at this time of the year. Um, like I said, on Tuesday night, you can come and help out in Toy Store. That's going to be from six to eight. Um, I saw some of you were bringing turkeys, and so we need to continue to bring as many turkeys as we can so that we can hand those out. We're going to have arm open on that, uh, that Monday before Thanksgiving, both in the morning and the evening, so that we can hand turkeys out. Um, and then I, I hope that you've been getting um, the, uh, the daily 
uh, uh, emails for the 40 days of prayer. I hope you're joining with me and with us in the 40 days of prayer as we enter into um, the Advent season. Um, and I've asked you to specifically do three things, if you remember. One is to pray for somebody in our church family. Um, it's especially good for you to think of somebody who you haven't seen in a while um, and pray for them. And then um, do some kind of a little, um, uh, a random chat of care is what I called it. Uh, so send them an email or a, or a text or call them or, or write a card or something to let them know that, that uh, their church is thinking about them and, and, you know, and that we love them. Um, in addition to somebody in our church family, I've asked you to pray for somebody specifically outside of our church family and do the same kind of a thing, do a little random chat of care for them. And then also to think of just some unknown person in our community. We're, we're going to be sending out cards uh, to invite people to come to our church uh, who are new in our neighborhood. And so we've got these empty seats that are around here and be praying for the people who will come to, uh, to worship with us during this season. Um, so those are different ways that you can help serve uh, at this time. Um, let, me, let me ask you, for those of you that are sitting at tables, when you leave, leave your chairs out. It'll be better for us when we fog afterwards um, to have the chairs sitting out. And speaking of fogging, um, Jim Hemsel has been gracious in being our permanent fogger up to this point, but it would be great to have two or three people who would, who would alternate with Jim so he doesn't have to feel like it's, uh, that burden is all on him. So um, if you would be willing to do that, talk to Jim and he'll help you through that. We also, as you came in and, and, and you, were, uh, you had your temperature checked, somebody needs to be there uh, to greet people. Um, uh, Lori was doing it this morning, but we need to write down the names so that if we have to do contact tracing, we know who to call and, and, and get with them. So all you have to do is sit there and write down the names of the people that come in and their temperatures. So that's easy. Um, and last, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give thanks to the veterans um, that are here. So if you are a veteran, would you please stand so that we can recognize you and thank you for your service. All veterans, please stand. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. We owe you a great debt of gratitude. All right. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Today we're continuing in our four-part sermon series titled The Good News About Death. And this is the third sermon in the series titled How Many Shopping Days Left? So let's open our Bibles to Psalm 90. Psalm is easy. It's right in the center of the Bible. Um, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. This is a, a prayer of Moses about God's eternity and our fragility, our human fragility. This may be the only psalm that's written by Moses. I'm, for those of you that are better Bible scholars than I am, you can correct me on that. But beginning at verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turned us back to dust and, and say, turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and in the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath, we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days pass away under your wrath, our years come to an end like a sigh. The days of our life are 70 years, or perhaps 80, if we are strong. 
Even then, their span is only toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. As the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays are approaching and we go into the stores and we see all the, the Christmas decorations, you know, that are, that are coming out now. And uh, we hear the Christmas music. I heard Christmas music yesterday for the first time. And uh, the Christmas catalogs start filling up our mailboxes. Then it just kind of seems inevitable that we start wondering then, well, how many days are left until Christmas? And that can put, a, a, put us in a state of mind where we're constantly reminded of, of how little time we have left to be able to buy Christmas presents. And it's even, um, it's even more difficult this year because many of us are not going to be getting together with our families for Christmas like we normally do. And so now not only do we have to think about what we're going to buy, but we have to think about how the presents are going to get delivered to them. Knowing that we only have a certain amount of time brings a, a sense of urgency to this time of the year. It makes it more diffi diff difficult and different from any other time of the year. And so thinking about how much time is left can cause a person to wonder, well, how many days do I have left to walk this earth? Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his letters and papers from prison said, There remains for us only the very narrow way, often extremely difficult to find, of living every day as if it were our last, and yet living in faith and responsibility as though there were to be a great future, thinking and acting for the sake of the coming generation, but being ready to go any day without fear and anxiety. That, in practice, is the spirit in which we are forced to live. It is not easy to be brave and keep that spirit alive, but it is imperative that we do so. Now, I don't want to cause anybody any anxiety, but it's predicted now that the average lifespan of an American is 76 years. Now, on average, women live longer than men, but um, for, for, for many, 70-some years is, um, is longer than they lived. You know, for many, some in this room have already made it past mid-70s. But on average, let's say that we get mid-70s for about how long we're going to live. Well, think about all the time that you spend shopping or all the time that you spend stuck in traffic or all the time that you spend stuck in lines at the grocery store. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like whichever line I pick, that's the one that's going to be the slowest one. Does anybody else relate to that? I don't know why, but it always seems to be so. So often it seems like all of these things that we, that, that we feel like we have to do, all of these things that seem urgent to us, that's what takes up all of our time. And it's only the leftover time that we have after that that we use to do whatever it is that brings fulfillment and joy to our lives. Well, what if you woke up every morning and you could see how many days you have left. You know, there's, there's an interesting um, uh, question. If, if you started reading a book and, and, and you got to a certain point, you realized, well, this is, this is my biography and, and you got to today, would you want to keep reading it? Would you want to know what happens to your life from here? So uh, imagine you've got a clock above your mirror in your bathroom, and that clock has a countdown on it for how many days you have left to work with. 
Do you think it might make you wonder if what you're doing is the best use of your time? I think each of us wants our lives to matter, don't we? Well, if your life is, is going to matter, then you've got to do one thing. You have got to get control of your time because your time is your life. If you don't learn how to manage your time, then you'll limit the ability you have for your life to matter. And we all have the same time every week. We all get 168 hours in a week. But it's what you do with that time that counts. You'll only have a certain number of days in this world. And if you waste them, you'll never get them back. If you waste time, you're wasting your life. So whatever you're doing, stop and ask yourself, is this the best use of my time? Is this the best use of my life? You simply don't have time to do everything. But the good news is that God doesn't expect you to do everything. So don't feel guilty about it because not everything is worth doing in the first place. One of the challenges that we face is between doing what is best for our lives against what is easiest especially when we're tired. When we're tired, we're more tempted not to want to do the best thing, but to do what is the easiest thing. That's why if you're really going to make your life matter, not only do you have to get control of your time, but you've got to get rest. If you're not rested, you won't have the mental, emotional, and physical strength to say, I'm going to do the best thing today instead of the easy thing. So don't waste your life. Don't go through life just existing. You're not here on this earth to just coast. God is guiding you on the path that will make your life matter the most. On the path that will bring you the greatest joy. And it all starts by asking, is what I'm doing the best use of my time? What things are taking up my time? How much are those things helping me to fulfill my mission in life? And what can I change in my schedule and priorities so that I can get more rest? You want your life to matter. And you never know about what you're saying to someone or how you're living your life and they're watching you, how that is going to impact somebody else. So for just one example of this from the Bible, remember what happened to Stephen in the book of Acts. After Jesus died, it took a while for his followers to settle down and to figure out how to get organized and, and, and how, to, how, how the process was, was, was going to work. Um, and one problem that came up early in the game was how to take care of those in need, especially uh, widows, they could, because they couldn't support themselves. And so the apostles decided to, to form a group so a small group, a committee, who was going to, to take care of that problem. And one of those who was appointed to that was Stephen. But Stephen's career was a short one. Because not only did, his, did he spend his time doing that, but in, a, in addition to that, he did whatever he could to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. And the... It was Jesus Christ, after all, who was the one that got him interested in the poor in the first place. If it wasn't for the church, how would we be motivated to do all the things that we do for people? So Stephen was motivated by Jesus to, to, to take care of the poor. And he was motivated to go out and to, and to preach the good news about Jesus. He healed and he preached and he taught. He changed people's lives. But it wasn't long before the Jewish authorities 
really began to, to call him to the mat for him to defend what they thought were his outrageous views. As far as they were concerned, Stephen was a bad apple. So Stephen makes them this long speech. He calls the Jews stiff-necked, circumcised as all get out in one department, but as mean as everybody else in others. After all, they'd given Moses a hard time in the wilderness, he said, and there'd not been a saint or a prophet since who they hadn't had it in for. And the way they treated Jesus was the worst example of all of them. And it was not just that they were missing the boat. They were doing their darndest to sink the boat. The authorities were, of course, enraged with Stephen putting them in their place. And so they decided they would stone him to death. Now, stoning somebody to death, especially somebody as young and healthy as Stephen, isn't easy. You don't get the job done with just the first couple of rocks. And even after you've got the person down, it's still a long, hot process. So to prepare themselves for their workout, they stripped off their shirts, they got their, their, their rocks, they needed somebody to hold on to their stuff while they were stoning Stephen. And so there was this young, fire-breathing, arch-conservative Jew named Saul who was there because he thoroughly approved what they were doing. And he was the one who held their cloaks and their shirts. It was a scene that Saul never forgot. Years later, when he had become a Christian himself, and he was under arrest, much as, as Stephen had been, he spoke of that day and the impact that Stephen standing up for Jesus had on his life. It was Saul who was to become Paul who watched, never occurring to him at the time that by the grace of God, he would follow Stephen's example. Now, the psalm that I read from, Psalm 90, agrees with the current national average that we have somewhere between 70 and 80 years to live. Moses' mood seems rather depressing at first glance, declaring human life just an insignificant blip on the cosmic radar screen. But the deeper truth here is that we who are life dust in the wind are precious to God our Father. Elsewhere in the Psalms, we'll hear it asked, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Or put in another way, don't you have better things to do than love us? But ironically, it's our fragility so easily forgotten that makes each moment matter. Death makes earthly life precious because it reminds us that we can take no day for granted. When we live as if we, we think we'll never die, then we waste time. We worry about things that don't really matter, things that are temporal instead of things that are eternal. We fret over things that are not in our control and we become consumed by the things of this world that don't really matter. But when we remember that our place in this universe is not a status that we have earned, but a a gift that has been graciously given to us by a God who loves us, then we'll better recognize the sacred weight of every second we get. So make your life matter. Let us pray. Dear God, I am full of wishes, full of desires, full of expectations. Some of them may be realized, many may not. But in the midst of all my satisfactions and disappointments, my hope is in you. 
I know that you will never leave me alone and will fulfill your divine promises. Even when it seems that things are not going my way, I know that they are going your way and that in the end, your way is the best way for me. Oh Lord, strengthen my hope, especially when my many wishes are not fulfilled. Let me never forget that your name is love. And now we continue with the prayer Jesus taught us saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What is truth? Where is truth? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. We are being torn apart by half of us saying this is what's true and the other half saying this is what's true. The one thing that will bring us together is to put our stake in the Bible, the word of God being the truth. And we are the people who are the spokespersons of the truth. The other people that are out there keep trying to get us sidetracked, thinking about things that are temporal, that don't really matter, things of this world that are not of God. And we have to come back to the center. The center is always Jesus Christ. When we feel ourselves being tugged, we come back to the center, to Jesus Christ. We come back to the word of God in the Bible. And we've got to share that word with others. That's the purpose of your life. That's why you're here. Every day should be a day where you are thinking, how am I going to somehow share the love of Christ with somebody? And not just in my example, but tell them the reason that I'm loving. It's because of the way that my life has been changed by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It has brought me a peace that is beyond understanding. It can bring you a peace that is beyond understanding too. We are the force for good in this world against all of the forces of evil and wickedness that are out there. We have got to be strong in what we're saying and what we're doing. Joshua, before he um, ended his, his book, he said these words. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve. What does he say? Serve. Serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. As for me. In my household, we will serve the Lord. As we share in Holy Communion today and as, as you pray, I want you to think about what you need to do in your life so that you can serve God better with whatever time you have. One of my great friends, I've told you this, one of my great friends when I was at, at Lover's Lane, he called his wife, he said, honey, I'm on my way home. The next thing she knew, the police were at her door because as he was driving down 183, there was an accident and he was killed instantly. None of us know how much time we have. So make your life matter. Loving God, we pray your Holy Spirit will be on us here and on these gifts of bread and, mine, uh, bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Help us, Lord, help us to be your voice, your hands in this world so that others may come to know of your great love for them so that they may be freed 
to be able to be a spokesperson for you too. Echo, ripple, make us a way for your love to further this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I invite you now to share in Holy Communion or in prayer. You may stay where you're sitting or you may come up to the prayer rails. God to endless years the same a thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening dawn short as a watch that ends the night before the rising sun time like
like an ever-rolling stream, there's all who breathe away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Oh God, our help. Who've spoken, taught the sun to rise? Whose lips proclaim the birth of light? Who sparked the kindling of the stars and set the fire in? planets learn their dance who poured the oceans from his hands whose breath awakened life from dust and these may breathless at his Jesus one and all heaven's best you rose to give us heaven's Oh, 
Are scandalous people. Do you know that? We are people of a scandal. We dare to believe that our God would become incarnate and live among us in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Did he come here to condemn us? No. He came here to redeem us and to reconcile us so that we would know that our God loves each one of us like there's no one else to love and yet loves each one of us the same. We are people of a great scandal. And Jesus came so that we would see in front of our faces how we are supposed to live our lives Every day, we are supposed to try to become more and more like Jesus. We are the people of hope. I believe the church is the hope of the world. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be wherever else I thought the hope of the world was. We are the hope of the world. So go out and share that hope with others in Christ's name. When we leave this place, wherever we go and whatever we do, how are people going to know that we are Christians? They will know we are Christians by our love. So hear this as your benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.